Cornelia van den Ende was born in 1902 in Schravenzande. It's a small village located 15 kilometers from here. Cornelia was my grandmother, and she lived in a century of enormous technological change. When she was young, she even didn't have a bike. She had to walk to school every day, five kilometers in the morning and five kilometers back in the afternoon. There were just some 200 cars in the Netherlands, and in less than 100 years, that number increased to seven million. There were also many crippled people, people with worn out and painful hip joints, caused by overuse in heavy labor, but also simply because of old age. This is a disease called osteoarthritis, and these patients were in constant pain every day and every night. There was no cure for it. Until the early 1960s, when John Charnley developed a hip prosthesis. And he even wasn't an engineer. He was an orthopedic surgeon. And that's one of those doctors that deals with problems of bones, muscles and joints. And the prosthesis he designed consisted of a metal stem that went into the upper leg bone with a metal sphere on top. And it articulated against a plastic cup that was put in the pelvis. And both components were fixed firmly into the bone using bone cement. And it was a huge success. This development was so successful that in less than 10 years, hip prosthesis became the standard treatment for advanced osteoarthritis. And today, about one and a half million hip prosthesis are being implanted every year. And that number is expected to increase dramatically in the coming few decades. And that's because people get older, but they also get heavier. Cornelia also got a painful, worn-out hip joint. And she was lucky, because she got a hip prosthesis like this one. And the quality of life improved enormously. She enjoyed life again. But after a few years, after implantation, the hip started to hurt. And the pain increased and became unbearable again. And the diagnosis was that the prosthesis had become loose. A thick layer of slimy scar tissue was formed around it. And the only treatment was to remove it and to implant a new, larger prosthesis. But the hip problem was not the only problem that Cornelia had. She also had severe heart disease and diabetes. And the risk of having a surgery were very high. The risk of severe complications or even death during surgery. So this time she was not so lucky. She did not get revision surgery. She had to live with severe pain every day and every night. About 10% of the hip prosthesis get loose before they have been in function for 10 years. So within 10 years after surgery. So that means that today there are a few hundred thousand patients like Cornelia. And that number of patients will also increase dramatically in the coming few decades. But why do these prostheses get loose? Well, you have to realize that they are functioning in a very harsh environment. It's warm and salty, and during impact, the load can be as high as 10 times body weight. So think about balancing a small car on top of this prosthesis. And then suddenly, it's almost a surprise that 90% of these prostheses last more than 10 years without any maintenance. Try that with your car. 
But still, we would like to improve the results. We would like to have 95% or 97% of success, or maybe even 100% uh, after 10 years. So that's the reason why many research groups and companies are developing new implants. And when you would have asked me 15 years ago, I would have fully agreed. I'm a mechanical engineer. I try to make new stuff. I would have fully agreed. But in the past 15 years, several hundreds of new hip prostheses have been released to the market, and none of these have shown better results than the ones that were already on the market for a longer period of time. So the old ones beat the new ones. And it's even worse. In these past 15 years, there have been also been several disasters, disastrous prosthesis designs. And that's not something of the past. Just three years ago, there was a new type of prosthesis, the so-called hip resurfacing prosthesis, or sports hip, intended for young patients. And it turned out that they had very poor clinical results. The sports hip became the horror hip. So, can we still improve results of hip prosthesis by improving design? No, I don't think so. We should start to think different. We should accept that prosthesis loosen, but we should not accept revision surgery. Develop maintenance strategies. My colleague and good friend, orthopedic surgeon Rob Nelissen, had a very simple idea. Why not inject cement into the bone via a tiny hole and refix the loosened prosthesis? And that's exactly what has been done in about 30 patients, just like Cornelia, my grandmother. The frail patient with very poor health that was not allowed to get a revision surgery. We have had patients that came into the hospital in a wheelchair in the morning and that went home walking in the afternoon. That's what cement injection can do. But there is a problem. The slimy scar tissue. When we inject cement, we can have stability for some time, but we don't know how long it will last. So we need to get rid of it. But how can we do that? Well, I'm pretty sure that most of you have once cleaned the tiles in your garden with a high-pressure water jet. If we could miniaturize it and get it into the bone, we might be able to get rid of that scar tissue. And we did several experiments, and we have shown that we were able to shred the scar tissue into tiny pieces. And now the next step is to integrate the water jet in a small diameter steerable surgical device so that we can really remove all the scar tissue. But we are scientists, and scientists tend to doubt everything. Do we really have to remove the scar tissue? What if we could turn waste into gold? What if we could turn scar tissue into bone? That's our second line of research. So we took scar tissue that would normally have been thrown away during revision surgery. We took it, we got it in the lab, we cultured it, and we applied different biological growth factors in different concentrations and combinations. And we have been able to create a basic form of bone in eight out of ten of the samples. I would good, uh, call that a very good start. So, but when we have those growth factors, how do we get it right on the spot where we need it? Well, we could simply inject it. But we could also embed it in a smart coating on top of the implant. And then when it's needed, we put the patient in a microwave oven, <laughs> heat up the prosthesis, and then the coating opens up and the biological factors are being released 
to treat right on the spot. And you would say you cannot put a patient in a microwave oven. Well, it's already done thousands of times a day all over the world in many hospitals. That microwave oven is called the MRI scanner. Look it up on Google. So, John Charlie once wrote, engineers and clinicians have to accept that hip prosthesis will never last 30 years. But he did not take the maintenance option into account. When we are successful in refixing prosthesis, I'm pretty sure that many prosthesis will last 30 years or more. John Charlie wouldn't have minded to be wrong on this. And Cornelia, my grandmother, she would have been proud. Thank you very much. <laughs>